veins. Mackie and Chad on Score North and scorenorth.com. I gave the coaches a lot of um, projects to do this week on Monday. And um, so, um, you know, I think probably being a little bit more specific coming out of halftime instead of saying, hey, these are the plays that we're thinking about running and, and you know, be, all right, here's what we're going to run. This first play, here's the second play, here's the third play, and we go from there. Is it almost like a self-scout that you might do during a bye week? Yeah, we, we just did a little bit early. We just I just felt like, you know, it was important to figure out what's going on here. Mike Zimmer already having come to Jesus meetings with his offensive coaching staff five weeks into the season. Um, boys, this is Reckless Speculation Thursday. Reckless Speculation. Yes, to all those who celebrate. Uh, we have allowed, it only happens like once every three years where Doogie goes on a vacation. And so we'll <laughs> allow it. We'll allow it once every three years. But in Doogie's honor, and he'll be back with us either late next week or maybe the week after the bye. But um, we've lined up a small handful of um, what we think are very speculative, compelling questions across three Minnesota sports teams. Reckless speculation. We love Dukes, but let's make one thing very clear. Reckless speculation starts with this trio. Like it starts and it ends starts here. With so like, us. like Doogie, Doogie, he's in the family. We allow him in the family. You can come in the door and speculate, but the speculation starts right here with the three yeah. of us. Let's, yeah, let's, okay, let's not make any bones about it, right? Like this is, we are the OGs, the yes. Godfathers. That's what I'm saying. Reckless we are the Godfathers. Speculation. <laughs> yeah. Reckless speculation. The reckless speculation mafia resides right on the screen on which I am looking at you guys. You when we put a buddies, you look to your pals, you look to the click. This is exactly <laughs> what it is right That's here. Right, right here. Yeah. When we when we put a white rose on your doorstep, doesn't mean we're going to kill you like the mafia did in the 1930s. It just means we want to trade for your player. That's, <laughs> yep. that's what it means. So let's start with this one. You heard the clip off the top there, Mike Zimmer. By the way, Mackie and Judd, Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment. And just keep in mind, we want titles, all right? There's a whole generation, maybe even two generations, of Minnesota sports fans that haven't seen a Twins, Wild, North Stars, Timberwolves, Vikings championship. And uh, we hold a high bar. So with that in mind, is or should Clint Kubiak be in trouble? He should not be in trouble because... Not because he's doing a great job, but because he is doing exactly what we thought he would do, which is he's 34. He's got no buffer between a crusty coach. And I feel like that crusty coach, who, by the way, is the head coach of the football team, is already starting to shove offensive people below the bus because his defense is starting to play well. So what's the problem here, offense? Pick it up. Well, Mike, you're sort of in charge of, of that, too. Uh, is he in trouble, though, from the reality of what's going on in Egan? This is how it starts, gentlemen. We've seen it before. This is how it starts. It starts with sort of sideways comments that um, aren't fully frontal, but they are interesting. I think if you didn't, the clip that Declan played to start this show, if you didn't listen to that and hear what Mike is saying, you missed the start of a potential snowball. And the potential snowball is Mike doesn't take a lot of blame, if any, for the offensive problems. Because he'll say, well, it's on all of us. But listen to his quote. His quote is very direct. He said, I sent them in. I have them. It's, he's talking it. about them as if it's now, like an outside entity. He's outsourcing it. But they, I mean, but them, it they. Still. But a defense is we, we, we. Offense right. is they, they, they. It's like, dude, you're the head coach. And he's you're the feeling, head coach. No, but he's feeling good now because his defense, point wise, points wise, is starting to do a good job, right? So um, should Clint Kubiak be in trouble? No, in my opinion, you're getting exactly what you asked for when you didn't have any veteran coach to help him, which they don't have like a Denison's gone, his dad is gone. I mean, Stefanski in year one had Gary Kubiak as a buffer. Mm -hmm. um, but do I think that we have started down the path of if they don't have a good second half against Carolina, now they're coming out of the bye and look at that schedule and those teams – I think it would be foolish to dismiss what Mike said yesterday as it'll get fixed and, and it's fine. I point you to DeFilippo, comma, John, 2018. Where's he right now, by the way? He is the quarterback's coach of the Chicago Bears. Oof. Spent a year as the Jaguars OC. Woof. And then I think he's in his, I think he's in year two. And uh, from what I've heard from my people in Chicago is, uh, 
let's just say he doesn't have real fond memories of his partial season in Minnesota. Oh, God, how would you, right? Like, they they sort of promised him. He, he was kind of anointed as, like, the next hot. The, the talk oh, yeah. was, hey, he's going to come in here, and if you're lucky, maybe he comes back for a second year, right? right. But but he's going to use it as a springboard to be the next hothead, the next Sean McVay or whatever. So I actually disagree. I think it's not necessarily all Clint Kubiak's fault, but I think he should be on a warm seat. This offense has weapons. Kirk Cousins has flaws, but he can be used more advantageously to maximize your upside offensively. Um, The offensive line has been better. Hasn't been elite, but it's been better in most categories than it was last year. And the Vikings, despite having weapons and despite having a very capable starting quarterback, even though he's got flaws, they rank 28th in second-half scoring. They're averaging 8 points per second half. Dallas is averaging 18 points per second half. It's remarkable. I did the math. It's it's remarkable, Phil. And it's even worse at home. The Vikings are the lowest-scoring second-half home team in the NFL, and it's not close. They're averaging 5 points per second half Mm -hmm. at home. And then I I saw that I don't want to give away all these because uh, I've got four interesting, compelling stats for Purple Daily today, the uh, state of the offense address. But here's another one for you guys, all right? And and you tell me, do you think this is conservative quarterback or conservative play calling? So the Vikings are eighth in pass attempts, which on the surface you'd be like, oh, what, what, what do you mean they're conservative? They're eighth in pass attempts. They're aggressive, right? They throw the ball all the time. But when you peel back the layers, this is going to get real wonky here. All right. I might have to fire this. All right. Get those nerds! 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 All right. So intended air yards per pass attempt, which is basically like how many yards did the ball travel in the air? And the, the reason why they use the word intended is because if you throw a ball 10 yards over, like let's say you're throwing to a receiver who's 10 yards down the field and you airmail him, and the ball travels 18 yards, like, well, you're intending to throw the ball 10 yards in the air, right? That's where the word intended comes from. So basically, how many yards in the air are you attempting to throw the ball per pass attempt versus, like, check downs or little screens or whatever? The Vikings rank 30th in the NFL, Mm -hmm. 6.6 average air yards per attempt. The Ravens are number one with Lamar Jackson. They're averaging almost 11 yards per air attempt. And so, again, whether it's they're just being more aggressive in the routes and the scheme or whether it's Lamar Jackson is just actively choosing to throw the ball more aggressively down the field, the Vikings are one of the most conservative passing teams. Also, on second and long, they're one of the most run-heavy teams. So the minute, oh, my God, we lost a yard on first down, the Vikings run the ball more often than any other team. So um, very conservative. Some of it might be Kirk, who doesn't want to take risks, but some of it's probably scheme and play calling. Yeah. they got to figure it out. Let me be very clear, though. If this doesn't work out, this is on one person, Mike Zimmer. That's my point. It's Kubiak is 34. You knew. I. We told you again. This is just like last year. How often did we talk about that? This. And, and he called, I think, one great game. If I recall correctly, how they came back against Seattle was impressive. But at some point in time, this is on Mike. You appointed the son of a friend who has, I mean, Phil, you've gone through his background. It's basically wide receivers coach at Kansas, quality control guy. You gave him this job, and now you're like, well, we are self-scouting ourselves to make sure. If anybody deserves to be in trouble off of this, it is Mike. It is not Clint. Now, if they all get fired, I don't care. But my point is, we have to stop um, with this. Well, the coordinator's not doing his job. I mean, Mike Zimmer is talking about loosely mentioned yesterday, and I did some checking, and this is unprecedented. Loosely mentioned um, scripting the start of the second half. Now, first of all, you have you have in halftime in this league twelve minutes. Okay, so you don't have the college. Hey, let's go have a hot toddy and talk about the first yeah. half time. You don't get a you don't get a week you to script your first yeah. fifteen plays, right? Yeah. Second of all, if you don't trust your offensive coordinator to call plays by feel of the game, what were you doing hiring him? Yeah. Mike is in his sixties. I'm I am in zero way going to say, yeah, they should change coordinators. If this is that bad, 
this is on Mike and it should be Mike's job. And Mike should be the one who has to in- answer the questions. And he also knows, here's the thing that drives me crazy. And Dennison being forced to go offside because he didn't get the COVID shot plays a role here. I get that, but that's still no excuse. Mike Zimmer needs a veteran buffer. He needs Gary Kubiak. Shermer was a, a veteran coach. Norv walked and Norv had been coaching forever, yeah. right? And now we're talking about this being on the plate of a 34-year-old kid who, by the way, is being asked to work with two of the most headstrong, obstinate people probably on the face of this earth, yeah. Cousins and Zimmer. So, so yeah, I'm not impressed by Clint, but the problem, the root of the problem, Clint is a branch here. Mike, Mike is the root here, and that's why it's frustrating to see him go down this path again when he was forewarned by people who do really good Marconi potential winning podcasts. That's right. That's right. Mar- the Marconi <laughs> finalist, Purple Daily, right up there. I, I thought we were supposed to find out like yesterday, but they, they, yeah. canceled, they canceled the award show because of COVID, and I don't know. Like They haven't announced the winner, so maybe they just – maybe At like we're like, we got to all go, and now, now you're like, <laughs> we're going to find out something. Uh, it was supposed to be last that. night, but I, don't, I haven't don't seen any what. winners yet. I'm sure Clay Mel Travis here with the information. We're up against Clay Travis, so – well, um, we gotta work. Maybe kick that one. Yeah. Wow. There it is. Oh, um, there all right. Let's get to the let's get to the next item here on reckless speculation Thursday. Reckless speculation. So, all right. So Ben Simmons has awkwardly shown back up to Philadelphia 76ers camp, and uh, Doc Rivers was even asked yesterday or a couple days ago, "Is he gonna like play?" And Doc's like, "I don't know." <laughs> it's, so it's super weird. Um, so I guess, all right, Judd posed these questions. I'll throw them out to the room here. Does Ben Simmons return to the 76ers increase the odds they will trade him? Does it get the wheels moving? Yep. And what is your current level of interest and or what would your offer be if you're the Timberwolves? I threw out the question because of this. I think that behind the scenes, everybody knows the the Simmons camp, the Sixers, everybody knows, d- despite the fact that there's friction uh, and probably some hatred there now that he has to be back to be traded for a decent package. Like I think if he if he sits out, who are the Sixers going to call and say you got to give us a lot? And they're going to be like he's not even he's not with your your team. Yeah. So um, I do believe that this is the first step in a trade being made. What I'm curious mostly from you, Phil, though, is is right now if you are the Wolves, what's the package? Because I will go back to. I like where the Wolves are going. I think that there's clearly chemistry here. So, like, this is not a, a fantasy basketball trade where you're just like, oh, I'll get take three guys. Yeah. Uh, so as, as the most diehard, passionate Wolves fan on this show and a complete crazy because I don't get why in life, what is your trade package right now? Because I know that you still like him. All right. This is, this is probably going to be me and my Wolves Kool-Aid drinking – uh, Homer self. That's what I wanted. Going down the wrong path, but because I'm, I've watched three preseason games. Uh, the Wolves have looked really good in those three preseason games. I'm also taking what I saw down the stretch last year. They beat Utah a couple times. You know, they played 500 basketball, maybe even a little bit above 500 basketball in like the last 20 games or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So what I'm hoping happens here is that the Ben Simmons. 76ers thing kind of drags into like December, January, whatever that looks like. Like maybe he even he plays, but it's weird. And they're just kind of, you know, they're, they're winning some games because they're talented, but it's it. But he it's kind of like Jimmy Butler, but, you know, maybe not quite as explosive as Jimmy Butler made it. I think Jimmy Butler has a more explosive personality. I think Ben Simmons would come in and just basically just ignore all of his teammates and do his thing and be a mercenary. Sure. I want to see what this group of Timberwolves looks like for like a month. I want to see D'Lo. I want to see Ant and Cat play together. I want to see Jaden McDaniels in his second year. I'm just really curious to see what this current collection looks like now that we've like, when it was all just a theory back in June, July, August, you know, all right, yeah, I because I, I do think that Ben Simmons on paper is a more valuable piece when put with this team than D'Lo is. Now, D'Lo's a better offensive player. Obviously, D'Lo's a better shooter. And if you need a bucket in the fourth quarter, is the guy you're going to turn to before Ben Simmons. Um, but I think this this team still needs perimeter defense. I think Ben would be such a great complement to 
the pieces, the the cats, Ant, Beasley, right? Um, that being said, after watching three preseason games, I'm like, ooh, ooh, this is <laughs> this is interesting. Oh, look at these guys. They're they're gelling. They're coming together. They got Patrick Beverly and Jaden McDaniels to worry about defense. And so I want to see what this looks like for a month. I don't know that Ben Simmons will be traded within a month of the season starting. Um, the Kyrie Irving stuff is really interesting because in Pennsylvania, I don't. I think you can you can play if you're not vaccinated in Pennsylvania. So like, there's been some rumblings of would the Sixers and the Nets swing a trade where Ben Simmons goes to the Nets or maybe it's a three team trade or something, and Kyrie goes to the Sixers, right? Which, I mean, you're looking for a great perimeter scorer to pair with. Joel Embiid, I mean, it would be, I wouldn't want to touch Kyrie Irving for a million different reasons. Right. Um, but I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the next month. But I want, I kind of want to see this current crop of Timberwolves. Am I crazy? No, you're not. But so, so if you, if you see them and they're good, but you say to yourself, okay, Ben Simmons defense would make a difference here, like a substantial one. What do you think, like, how far would you be willing to go trade wise? If, I, if, 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 if in the first guys out as well, this is where, all right, if, if in the first month of the season, it's just very obvious the Wolves are a below 500 team, like you can just kind of tell. And D'Lo is, you know, D'Lo's going four for 13 every other game or something, you know, then I get more aggressive. Yep. But then I watch these preseason games and I see Jaden McDaniels popping threes from the corner. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, if, even if you could get Ben Simmons without giving up D'Lo, do I want to give up? Jay McDaniel's rookie scale contract for the next three years. And it's like, and again, this is me just guzzling right, current no, roster wolves Kool Aid. That's why I asked. You're going to have to part with good players if you want to get Ben Simmons. Sure. Um, but again, if the Wolves start hot and they look like they're gelling, and Chris Finch has elevated this thing and they're playing hard, I don't know. Maybe I'm bored with it. I don't know. What about you, Declan? I, I think it doesn't hurt his trade value. Um, I just. As, I think even with everything going right for the Wolves, if it goes right, I, I don't see them being like still a juggernaut in the West. Uh, I think they'll look competitive, and I think they'll look more gelled because finally everyone, hopefully knock on wood, is healthy and, and, and no one's getting injured and finally get to see this core and nucleus together. Um, but I do think Simmons probably gets moves in the, moved in the next month. Um, it, he obviously had to report those fines were going to keep adding up, but I, I, I don't see him being in Philadelphia by the start of the regular season, if he does, it's, it'll be like a Jimmy Butler situation where he's probably moved within the first dozen games or so. It's going to yeah. be uncomfortable, and the Sixers are probably just going to have to accept they won't get the return that they're seeking for him. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's just weird. Like this, all of this would have been better solved back in like July or August, so that all right, if the Wolves were going to make this trade, you're not uprooting something that was now molded throughout training camp. You know, and, and now it's kind of weird because now they're all gelling and they love. They can, <laughs> you can tell they love playing together, and it's like. The, the chemistry was probably pretty good when they were working out in the offseason, but once you get everyone in camp, it's like now you run the risk of upsetting something that looks like it's gelling. Well, yeah. So, and is, is Ben a frustrated guy who has gone off the deep end because of what transpired against the Hawks in the playoffs? Is he the guy, the guy who can become a malcontent again? Like, I don't know him, and that's the problem too. Because if he's going to come here, play defense, play hard, and be a good guy. That's a, that's a big di- difference from a guy who might struggle shooting again, and now he's frustrated again, and you start to go through that. So yeah. I would need to know or have a really good idea personality-wise, off the court-wise, what I'm getting. Yeah, and, and we don't know. Like we, We've never seen him in the NBA outside of that weird Philadelphia environment. It is weird that he hasn't taken more steps to shoot more. Um, and then you watch him in some of these videos in the off season. It's like he clearly he has a decent shot. And he, he's knocking down threes and TikTok videos. Like it's mental, man. So, but I I'm I'm aware of his flaws. Right. His strengths are being underplayed. Like people aren't right. talking enough about his strengths. People act like he can't score too, well, just because he can't shoot. I mean, he scores at a at a very great rate inside ten feet. Yeah. So. Yep. You're right. All right. All right. Item number three here. <laughs> Speculation. On this Reckless Speculation Thursday. By the way, uh, later in the show here, we're going to talk to our friend Greg Wyshynski, senior NHL writer for ESPN.com, and get his thoughts on the Wild. Uh, but this one is 
wild speculation related here, and uh, it's sponsored by the Wild, unbeknownst to them. <laughs> We're giving away wild tickets, wild preds, on October 24th, and all you have to do if you want a chance to win them is open the Score North app. It's free to download. Register and enter through listener rewards. We're going to pick a winner on October 21st. If you're a college student, college night discounts are back this season, and wild tickets start at just $39, and there's a few games to choose from each month. So find out more at wild.com slash theme packs and enter to win wild Preds tickets on the Score North app. Uh, Dex, you go ahead and set this one up, but uh, it sounds like there might be a goalie available here uh center center dylan strome oh i'm sorry sounds uh, i know i know a lot about hockey the he's hockey whisperer. Ben Simmons. he's on and ben there Simmons. might don't don't distract him <laughs> no, knowing the wild goaltending issues they could be always looking for a goalie so let's let's also never rule that out with reckless speculation with the wild uh but dylan strome uh the chicago blackhawks who has been kind of on the block on and off for like the last year and a half with chicago um a former third overall pick uh, his brother is a prolific player for the Rangers. He comes from a bloodline of hockey players. Uh, but last night on opening night was scratched, was a healthy scratch for the Chicago mm. Blackhawks. And when he came to Chicago from Arizona, he spent three seasons in Arizona and then was traded to Chicago at the deadline in 2019 and actually played pretty damn well for Chicago in those 58 games. He had 51 points, um, looked like a nice another center behind Jonathan Taves. You thought, oh, God, here comes Chicago, and they're going to have just another great center behind him. Well, ever since then, he's kind of hit a wall. He's been a little bit ineffective, um, kind of mostly been a power play guy, hasn't been as strong five-on-five five after his first kind of impressive debut with Chicago, and now he's on the trade block. Um, with Kirby Doc in Chicago emerging and obviously Jonathan Taves being unmovable, they look at Strom and say basically, all right, we're open for business. We can move this guy. He is a center. He's a third overall pick. Dude, I kicked great. around. Third overall pick. Yeah. He was a third in 2015. So, I mean, yeah, he's got a pedigree. He's definitely got skill. Um, and last year with Chicago, he didn't play with the top players. He mostly played in a bottom six role and, and scored almost the majority of his goals on the power play last season. Um, but he is someone I would 100% take a, a chance on. Uh, he's, he's a guy who I think would benefit from a new change of scenery. He'd benefit from most likely playing with someone like Kevin Fiala. Th- this would be someone to take a chance on 100%. I don't think the Wild would give up a first or second round pick or a top prospect to land him uh, because his value is kind of pretty low right now. But he, when, when Pierre Lebrun says, I can see him being moved in the next week, which he said on TSN yesterday, hmm. I mean, if Lebrun is saying, look, at, look for him to be moved in the next week or two, He's probably going to be moved. So if I'm the Wild, I would pick up the phone and try to figure out some type of trade. But that compensation coming back to Chicago is a little tricky to figure out, Judd. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get him because I I think that they're probably going to want for him a first-round pick, a a high pick, or to your point, a top prospect. And I don't think, you know, I I know that Phil does not care about this, but I think if you're the Blackhawks, you're also also not going to give him away to a team in your division at the start of a season. My question from the Wild standpoint, and we don't know the answer to, to this, and we touched on this uh, in Judd's hockey show yesterday as well, Phil. My question is this. What is the grand plan short term as well for for Marco Rossi, who's gone to play in, in um, Des Moines? He's going to start the season there. And I think he's going to play a ton. He's probably almost certainly going to be first line. If the thought process is, okay, he's going to pop there, and w- when he pops, he's going to come up, I don't know, take your pick, December or so. Or are they thinking, yeah, you know, he didn't play it last year, basically. He needs to play a lot more, and so we basic, we are, we are don't have that guy. So to me, the talk about potentially trading for a center, which is going to be expensive, like that's never cheap. That's never, never cheap. Uh, really comes down to what's your plan for Rossi and how quickly do you expect him to emerge? Because if you expect him up here in two months, you're probably not going to make a huge trade. If you're like, well, it might be a while, that would at least give me cause to say we probably should explore something that could that could certainly help our top six at that position. Well, do you okay, over the next five years, and I get that you guys have focused more on Rossi than you have on Strom, but which player has a better chance to be a first line center in like two years from now. Rossi. Rossi. Who's the higher upside? Rossi. 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 Oh yeah. His his Rossi. His upside is extremely high. 
We just don't know how. But at what point? At one point, didn't I mean, if this dude was a third overall pick, like at one point, didn't the entire league think the same thing about mm -hmm. Dylan Strom's upside too? Probably. That's like this is an interesting buy low candidate, and I just heard his name for the first time this morning. Well, then so. you're, you're not listening because Declan Goff has been talking about this guy for like three That's years, inclu including at one point being filleted by wild Twitter when he I threw got out killed. the possibility and he absolutely got ratioed like I've never seen before. <laughs> um, this is an interesting one. I will say this on the third overall pick just to slow the roll a little bit. He was the third overall pick by the Coyotes who are sort of a weird team. Like they've had, they, they haven't always had the best of luck and, and so I, I'm not sure that he is really like a oh, third overall pick. He was going to be fantastic. It's an interesting one. I just, Dex, I think the problem is, to your point, compensation. I don't think you could get him back for what Bill Guerin would be willing at this point to surrender. Right. And, I mean, if I'm the Wild and I can get him for a third or fourth round pick, I'm all in. Like, I am I'm totally am. Oh, and yeah. I would do that in a heartbeat. But his value's in the tank. I don't think a team's going to give up a first round pick for him. And also with Boldy, Rossi, and even Adam Beckman to that, to that degree, we talk about Rossi's ceiling being a first-line player. We talk about Matthew Boldy most likely being a first-line or top-six guy. Now this Adam Beckman kid has a hell of a camp, and he's part of it. The issue is now Wild fans have this surplus of prospects, and this goes to baseball too. The likelihood of all three of them hitting their top ceiling is incredibly low. It's most likely going to be one of them that hits their top ceiling. So I, I would definitely not part with Rossi or Boldy, but if it's Beckman or if, if 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 you want to figure out something, I would consider it. I would consider it. Reckless speculation. Well, you guys, uh, Judd's Hockey Show is in full effect here. Season Monster starting. Show. Monster preview. Yeah. That's all I'll so, say. So uh, you guys can uh, check that out multiple days a week on the Mackie and Judd podcast feed, or there's a separate feed that we have for Judd's Hockey Show. Uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna welcome our friend Greg Wyshynski into the show for a little bit of a national perspective on the Wild. So stick with us.